What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the E4 Explicit Podcast. And today I talk to one of the smartest people that I've ever known or or had a chat with, Vincent Racaniello, who is 40 plus years as a virologist. He is a PhD professor at Columbia University in New York. Brilliant man. We talk about everything COVID. We talk about the misconceptions, Trump. Um, we talk about everything that you thought you knew about COVID and more. He helps me understand what a virus actually is. We spend a lot of time debunking a lot of the things that you probably hear or see in the media that just are not true. Um, we talk about the vaccinations. We talk about how, how good they are, how long they've been around, all that stuff to really clear the air with what you're seeing and hearing in the mainstream media, how this virus and pandemic has been politicized and used uh, by our politicians to to gain notoriety and gain more uh, votes. So make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you get notified every single time I come up on your screen, which is about every Friday. I might slide in a couple more episodes in between then. Enjoy this episode of the E4 Explosive Podcast with Columbia professor and virologist Vincent Racaniello. What's up, guys? Today's episode of the E4 Explosive Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. They're the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer. This guy. The Lawn Mower 4.0. You heard that right. The Lawn Mower 4.0. It's got a flashlight. So join over 2 million men worldwide, just like me, that trust Manscaped and get an exclusive offer just for you. You're going to get 20% off plus worldwide free shipping. Use the code EXPLICIT20 at manscaped.com. Welcome back to another episode of E4 Explicit Podcast. I'm Corey. Today we have Vincent Racaniello, PhD professor from Columbia University. He's a virologist, very smart uh, individual. So Vincent, thank you for coming on. Can you give the listeners and watchers a little uh, background on, on who you are and kind of what your career is based off of? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me, Corey. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. I, um, as Corey said, I'm a pref- professor of virology at Columbia. I have been there since 1982, probably before most of you were born. And um, I have before that, I learned how to work with viruses. So I got a PhD working on viruses. It took me uh, to get fully trained. I guess it took me about eight years. Then I went to Columbia to start my lab to do experiments on viruses. So I've been there doing research, mostly polio virus, uh, more recently some other viruses. But then I got involved in teaching virology to undergraduates at Columbia. I wrote a virology textbook. I started blogging and then I started podcasting 12 years ago. And so now um, I do all kinds of communications stuff about viruses. I have a YouTube channel, I make videos and I teach online. So I find that most people don't know too much about viruses. And since I've been thinking about them for 40 years, I figured why not share uh, some of what I know. And so that's what I'm all about these days. Right. Well, that's, that's, and that's why I'm talking to you today, for sure. Um, you know, you couldn't be a, uh, it's not a better time, I guess, to be a virologist or know yeah. this kind of stuff. Um, one thing that I noticed the, the polio in your background, the polio, um, mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty fascinating, because a lot of people that I talk to, um, at least when it comes to the vaccination cards, I talked to a um, a political philosopher a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine, James Harrigan, and he was because he's he's pro vax and he's all that stuff, and he just thought it was crazy. Like, like uh, the the polo the polio vaccination cards look exactly like the, that's right the cards that we have now. If you're fully vaxxed and you get, and he was like, you know, people went in the streets and were were so happy. I'm not saying polio is COVID or similar to it. It's not killing our children like polio was. Um, but it had similarities as far as like the vaccination and like people were happy about it. And I think you said, you know, if you've been doing, you talk or learning or uh, teaching and learning about viruses for the last 40 years, it hasn't like me personally, uh, if I don't talk to a virologist, I don't think about it. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know a lot about it, which is 
probably the most case for people. Um, mm. And one of the things I, uh, I learned from talking to a friend of mine, Rebecca Katz, who's uh, at Georgetown University. Um, she's on Biden's COVID task force now. Um, and she, she blew my mind uh, when we were talking about viruses. I mean, Ebola, um, swine, all this stuff, um, which kind of, do and this is, I talked to her, man, I talked to her in February. I talked to her in like December, 2019. And then I talked to her, uh, I think it's like February 13th was the last time I talked to her of 2020, literally like right before shit hit the fan and everything was in lockdown. Um, and it kind of like, just made me really think about viruses, where they come from and, and how serious they can be. Cause like I said, a lot of people don't get affected by it, but I'm glad to be talking to someone like you who knows a lot about this stuff. Um, so can you kind of explain straight up, what is a virus? All right, a virus is, is uh, something that, like you said, most people don't think about it, right? Yeah. You, get, you get flu now and then you get a cold, but you know, we have, gotten rid of most of the nasty viruses of childhood. You know, when I grew up, uh, you'd get chicken pox, you'd get measles, sometimes you'd get polio. Wow. You don't get any of that anymore because of uh, vaccines. So people stopped thinking about viruses. And now in the last 15, 20 years, all of a sudden there are these outbreaks of weird viruses, coronaviruses, Ebola viruses that spill over from animals. Uh, and it sort of gets people's attention for a bit and then it goes away. So what is a virus? A virus is a, is an organism uh, which is very small. You can't see it with your eye. And I think the most important property is that it needs to get inside of a cell to make more of itself. So it's just a piece of, of nucleic acid, which means DNA or sometimes RNA. So viruses are unusual that can have RNA instead of us and everything else on the planet has DNA. They can have a piece of RNA or DNA. It's wrapped in a protein and sometimes a membrane, really small, and that's it. And it needs to get inside of a cell and then it reprograms the cell to make more of itself. So it's a parasite and it we call them obligate intracellular parasites because they have to get inside of a cell in order to make more viruses and then they take something from the cell that's why we call that's what a parasite is right uh there are human parasites too that take from other people as you right. know viruses take from the cell and sometimes they kill the cell actually in in the process of making more of themselves so that's really an unusual uh, approach to being if you will on on earth this idea that you get inside of another cell and, and you reproduce and you may or you may kill the cell and then of course uh, the virus needs to spread it needs to find a new host. It will infect a bird, a human. Every every living thing on the planet has whole collections of viruses in them. Everything you look at, if you see a plant or a dog or a bird, a fish, all of them have viruses of their own and they may or may not make them sick. So viruses have been around probably longer than anything else uh, on the planet. So they're really old. They've had a long time to sort things out. Yeah. <laughs> and they're really good at it. So that's that's a long definition of what a virus is, but you can't see it. And in fact, Corey, you and I right now are full of viruses. They're reproducing in us. We're okay. Most of the time we have the, as you know, everybody has a whole collection of bacteria in them, right? The microbiome that, you know, in all of our organ systems, and we think they're good for us. We, I think we have the same thing with viruses. It just hasn't been as well studied. So they're all over at any given time uh, and they're tiny and need to get inside you in order to make more. Right. So that's great explanation. I, I kind of looked at your, uh, your class that you kind of <laughs> teach is what is a virus? I was like, Oh, you see here. Um, well, that kind of like leads me into a lot. I want to talk a lot, probably more than likely a lot about COVID and stuff like that, obviously. Um, just because it's affected so many people's lives, uh, it affected my life. It's affected yours, obviously. Uh, this is your your sure. life's work, kind of. Um, so, you know, the what you just said kind of like made me think of a, a question that I, I get a lot actually. Um, is you know you can't see them, right? So, mm -hmm. in regards to masks, <laughs> uh, and you probably get asked this all the time. Um, why why do we have to wear masks? Uh, preferably the N95s, the ones that are medical masks um, were probably more efficient. But if you can't see them, 
you know, not that we would need to see them to not wear a mask, but can they go through masks? Like, what would be your kind of like reasoning for wearing a mask if you are? I don't know any of your beliefs or what you think. I mean, I know you're a man of science, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, I believe in science myself. Um, as much as of a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory person, I can be. I, I, I tend to lean on the side of like, listen, I, I want people that are smarter than me around me so sure, that's sure. kind of how i i live but you know can you kind of give me a reason why masks would be important so viruses as i said before they have to find another person to infect another host of some kind so they have to spread right from right. if we're talking about people it's person to person and there are a couple of different ways that viruses spread and a big way is from the respiratory tract right when you talk or breathe or cough, you're always sending out droplets, actually. So even now, as I'm talking, especially with the plosives, right, the P's and the T's, yeah. we send out, you know, our microphones are covered with, with our spit, basically, because of that, we send out this huge collection of particles, all different sizes, right? And those are where the viruses are, inside those droplets. And we don't really send out naked viruses, into the world, right? They're always in something. Sometimes uh, they're in blood, sometimes they're in feces, um, and sometimes in respiratory droplets. And so that is the key to why masks work, because the droplets are way bigger than a virus. You know, a droplet of, 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 of fluid that we exhale, and, and just talking does it. You don't have to cough or sneeze, just talking does it. Those droplets can have hundreds of millions of viruses in them. That's how big they are. You can't even see the droplet, really. If you if you took a picture of a person sneezing with a light behind them, you, you've seen those pictures. Oh, yeah, probably. it's like, you know, yeah. they're exhaling. It, otherwise, you don't see those droplets. So they're but they're pretty big. They can have a lot of viruses in them. And so those droplets are what get hung up in the mask material. It's not the viruses because you're not really uh, shedding any naked viruses without a droplet around it. And the droplets get stuck because they're pretty big. They get hung up in the mask and that's why they work. And I think a lot of people think that the mask is holding the virus back. I, I get asked that a lot and it's not the virus really. Yeah. The virus would go through the mask if it could, but in fact, we don't exhale many viruses we, only in the, in the form of droplets. So they get hung up in the mask. And then they don't go on their way to to infect somebody else. Oh, yeah, that's I think that's kind of and that's another thing I wanted to talk about is like the, the misconceptions a lot of 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 COVID, right? Um, of viruses in general it doesn't even have to be COVID. Um, sure. I mean, I know you know back in the day whether it was you know Ebola or AIDS, it was like oh, like if you know I remember in school they would teach you like if someone's bleeding, don't touch their blood. It was like really, can it be like that kind of direct where it would be you know you can get infected at that point like uh, wouldn't i happen to have an open wound too or you know something it would have to work kind of like perfectly i think for it to kind of you know go through but with the masks you know especially you know i, I kind of was confused a little bit about the misconception of if you're vaxxed mm -hmm. you should you should be good when it comes to um wearing masks but if i'm correct me if i'm wrong just because you're vaccinated does not mean you cannot spread a virus does not mean you can't get it. It's just from what I hear, read and see on the news is basically it's if you're vaccinated, which, you know, be transparent, I'm fully vaccinated. Um, not that this matters because you're in New York, I'm in Colorado. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, it um, the, the misconception is like, if you're fully vaxxed, you don't need to wear a mask. Um, but just because you're vaxxed doesn't mean you can't get it. I know plenty of people that have are fully vaxxed have got COVID. It wasn't nearly as severe as right, what it right. could have been. And I think that's the piece where people get a little confused. No? Sure, sure. So this is a this is a complicated issue because because we're in a pandemic, it's an emergency, things happen quickly. Uh, people have to make decisions before they have all the information. So, you know, WHO and CDC have to make statements about how to behave, and they may not have all the information that they need, okay? Mm -hmm. So we need to talk a little bit about vaccines. Most human vaccines don't prevent you from getting infected with polio or influenza or measles or whatever. You, you always get infected, but then 
the vaccines, the antibodies in the cells that the vaccines, the immunity given by the vaccines, they, they kick in in a couple of days and they prevent you from getting really sick and dying. So that's where they're, they're, they're working. And vaccines do not in general prevent infection. They do prevent severe illness and death. And that's exactly what we're seeing with COVID. But a lot of people are surprised by that. They say, oh, it should prevent infection. And it did right after the vaccine trials. How come it doesn't anymore? Well, because at, right after the vaccine trials, people's antibody levels were really high in the blood and in the respiratory tract, but that slowly goes down. That's a natural process. So within eight months, a year, your antibody levels are low. So that if you then tend to inhale some virus, multiply for a couple of days until your immune memory kicks in and then tamps it down. So it doesn't prevent infection. You might, whether you shed enough to transmit is a really good question. I have not yet seen the data which proves convincingly to me that infected people transmit. If they do, it's far less than, uh, say, a person who's not vaccinated. And uh, if a study was done in Singapore a couple of months ago, where they looked at people who were vaccinated and unvaccinated who had just gotten infected, and they did nasal swabs, and they measured viral load by PCR, right? And the people, both groups got PCR positivity in the nose, but the vaccinated people went down really quickly in a, mm. in a day or two because the immune response is kicking in and the unvaccinated people, it stays high. And that's, those are the ones that are transmitting. So your question should, why do vaccinated people have to wear a mask? It is because of being cautious. In my opinion, there isn't good data that says vaccinated people transmit very well. Maybe they, but you get, also you have to remember that when you vaccinate millions of people, everybody has a slightly different response to the vaccine. We're not all the same, right? We're genetically different. We're, that's the way we are in all kinds of traits. Some people are strong, some people are weak. Some people make great immune responses. Some people make poor. And so the ones who make a weaker immune response, maybe they could shed a little bit more virus and transmit. So in the situation where most people in the US are still not protected in some way, either by vaccination or infected, CDC decided, let's have everybody wear a mask to protect everyone. Because if you start saying, oh, only unvaccinated people have to wear a mask, you know, that's kind of hard to enforce because then people would just say, oh, I'm vaccinated. I don't have to wear a mask. So everybody wear a mask. I don't, th I personally think if you're vaccinated, you, you wouldn't have to wear one, but it just makes it easier in terms of public health response to do that. I, I hope that makes sense. Oh, okay. it makes total sense. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and that's kind of like, even when it first started, I was, you know, not when it first started, I was like terrified, but when it became like a thing where when we were allowed to go into public and you had to wear a mask everywhere, it, it didn't bother me so much just because like I'm a 33 year old uh, young man. I've had three open heart surgeries. So technically I'm mm -hmm. um, I have some issues where my, my cardiologist is like, listen, you got to get vaccinated. And I'm like, I don't know. I've been listening <laughs> to Alec Jones too much. I need to I need to learn some more data or some more science first. Um, I went ahead and did it anyway. But um it was more of like wearing the mask. I, it didn't, it wasn't a thing where I know a lot of people are like, Oh, it's my constitutional right. Oh, it's really not. But um, I think those are a little bit extreme, but it's, if it's, if it's going to help other people like elderly people that, that, that need, you know, they need to stay away that need, sure, they, sure. they can't do certain things. It's, I feel like it's not that big of a deal. Um, but to your point of not having all the data, that's exactly how it felt when it first started. Cause I feel like no one, obviously no one really knew anything, um, I was fascinated. I went back and watched my, my podcast with Rebecca Katz, the doctor from Georgetown, everything she was saying, she was like, you know, Hey, don't be surprised if we're wearing masks, uh, two years from now. And this is before anything came out. Like, no, there was no cases in the United States. Yeah. And I was like, you're crazy, Rebecca, no way. We're not going to be wearing masks. This isn't China. And then, uh, you know, we're talking about where it came from, all this stuff. And she was pretty much spot on. I, a lot of it was guessing, but she was just kind of like going down like the basic, like, this is what would or should happen. She was calling. She's like, listen, don't be surprised if schools start getting canceled. And I'm like, no way. And then literally mm -hmm. two months later, the, the entire world shut down, no school. And I was just like, I texted her. And I'm like, 
are you Miss Cleo or something? Like, well, how did you know? And it, she was like, it's not, it's not that I knew anything. No other virologist or any would know. This is just common sense things on how you would sure. probably yeah. take care of a situation like this. And I remember when they shut down, it was like, first it was like two weeks, then it was four weeks, then it was six weeks. Do you think that if we would have just shut down completely, completely for the six weeks, it would have kind of made a, a bigger difference? Or we really don't know how the shutdown affected i know how it affected the economy because i've spoken to, spoken to a bunch of economists but as far as other things do you think that was the the right call the right way to go well we we only have to look at china right which shut down pretty quickly right um they saw what was going on in wuhan mm -hmm. and they shut down all travel in and out of wuhan and then the rest of the country and they did pretty well at controlling it, you know, I was watching the uh, the outbreak maps early on, and all the, you know, for a while, only only in China did you see the dots where there were cases, right? And then right. It started to spread elsewhere, and then as it exploded globally, it went down and down in China. They did a great job at containing, it. and I think they were very draconian in their sh in their shutdown, right? Everybody masked, but everybody's traced and tracked, right? You can't go anywhere without them knowing where you are mm -hmm. so you couldn't leave your apartment they'd come and get you and put you back in and that worked but could we do that in the u.s i don't think so i don't think we could shut down to that extent and the other thing is we we latched on to it late you know we know now that there were cases in january you know you pick up a few cases i think in washington the west coast there were some of the earliest cases if you pick up one case there are already uh, probably a hundred that you haven't picked up yet so I, I think i mean certainly shutting down to some extent would have helped but if it's half baked no what i think would have been better would have been to have really widespread testing early on which we didn't have for a long time because if you can test and see who's infected you could then quarantine them and make a big inroads towards restricting the spread but uh, we didn't have that and if we had from day one, boy, that would have made a big difference with with moderate lockdowns and extensive testing, then we could have controlled it. But we we were late to get on the testing. And even now, you know, our testing isn't all that great. There are a lot of you know, we should be testing very frequently in many parts of the country to see who's infected and restrict it. But we're not. We're not even doing that. Yeah. I definitely feel like it's it's gone. It's kind of like classic America where something happens in the news and then our attention span is like, oh, okay. It's kind of <laughs> over now. It's not, I mean, this is probably the longest that I've seen the American public care about something in a long time. Yeah, agreed, uh, agreed, yeah. Which is unfortunate. Um, it's funny you say that because um, as far as like the early cases, um, my fiance was in Orlando in like early February, like the first week of February. And she was at, she went down for a conference, but the first few days before the conference, she went to, Disney World. I went to like Hogwarts. She's a Harry Potter fan. Um, and she was fine. And then literally that Monday, she was supposed to be at the conference from Monday to Friday. She was like deathly ill. She didn't even leave her um, mm. her her room. And then they sent her to uh, ER or whatever. She got tested, said she had the flu. At that mm. point, they weren't testing for COVID. They were only testing for the flu. I am certain because she everything she said that she had wrong with her was like, covid symptoms like spot on the entire hotel got sick um it was like a big thing and she she flew back a week later not knowing if because they weren't testing for covid yeah. so i was certain she had um you know covid but those early those early things that we didn't know i guess were kind of it's not really you don't know what you don't know right and it's something that's so sure. new um and as but, far as go ahead but you did people traveling in those right. early days like she may have been infectious and everybody else. And that's really what seeded it all over the U.S. Because as soon as it started, we saw it everywhere. Major cities, you know, then shortly after we had a lot in New York City as well, because we didn't restrict. So if we had had a good test for her and we, we could have said, oh, you're positive. You need to stay in your hotel for 14 days. She wouldn't have liked it, but that would be a good way. That's what they did in China. And yeah. even now, I know a number of Chinese scientists that go back and forth to China. You get there, and maybe not today, but at least six months ago, you had to stay in a hotel for two weeks 
at your expense. You ate all your meals in the room. You couldn't leave. And they enforced it until you were for two weeks and then they let you out. Can you imagine? And they did it. Wow. <laughs> he said they would put the meals on a tray outside his door. They would knock and run away. And then he'd, he'd get the meals in three meals a day. Can you imagine? For, and he had to pay for it all himself. What? <laughs> yep. It's like jail. Oh, my gosh. Well, China can get away with that kind of stuff. You know, it's yeah. it, you do that here. It's you're going to have a revolution. No question. Um, man, that's crazy. Uh, back to the vaccines real quick. I know a lot of people were, um, you know, uh, I'm glad we cleared that up to where it's a lot of people in myself, too, as far as vaccinations just before I spoke to Rebecca was like not understanding clearly what they were for. They're not to prevent things or pre they're to help you get through them and not be as severe um, for the most part. But when it comes to the vaccines, I know a lot of people were like, oh, they sped through this. They've they've made this like in a year. You know, it's already getting pushed emergency, you know, pushing through with Pfizer and Moderna and stuff. And then. I was like, yeah, that is kind of crazy. I want to wait till there's more studies. But haven't they been working on viruses like or uh, inf um, vaccinations for viruses like this for decades? Oh, of course. <laughs> so we've been making viral vaccines since the 1940s, right? And we have a lot of them that we have licensed and are given to people, hundreds of millions of people. They're fine. They prevent serious disease. The polio vaccine, you don't get paralyzed anymore, right? Nope. All right. A flu vaccine is not as good. You know, you can still get a little bit of influenza. People are working on that, but measles, mumps, rubella, hepatitis vaccine, um, all really good. They, they've they eliminated the childhood infectious diseases that we all used to get when I was a kid. Um, so yes, we've been working on vaccines for a long time. We know the technology. Now this, along comes a pandemic and it's an emergency because this disease is severe, right? It kills 20% of people, especially if you're over a certain age. And now, then we find out it can have long-term effects, which last for who knows how long, long COVID, right? Mm -hmm. and so the decision was made that we need to make a vaccine as quickly as we can. What's the downside? You want to spend 10 years? So most vaccines take 10 years before this, right? Really, you want to spend 10 years with lots of people dying? No, I don't think that's an option. We have the tech to do it quickly. So they, you know, in the US, we decided to invest in a couple of different vaccines, mRNA vaccines, which had never been uh, put in people before, and then adenovirus vectored vaccines, which had seen some use in people before. And the reason was they could be produced really quickly at high quantity. And then we designed a way to test them really fast. So typically you test a vaccine in three different waves of testing, phase one, two, and three. And normally you do a phase one with say 20 or 30 healthy people, and you just give them a dose of the vaccine, you make sure everything is okay. And this has already been tested extensively in animals in the lab. So you pretty much have an idea that it's gonna be fine. And then you wait typically six months, a year to analyze the data, collect the data, analyze it, and then you do your phase two. Well. This was planned. We're going to finish the phase one. If it looks good, we're going to start right away a phase two. So they were fast tracked one after each other. And so we got a, a number of new vaccines in less than a year, which I have to say, I've never seen before in my career. It's amazing because I thought we wouldn't start vaccinating until now, pretty much now. I, that was my prediction it would take. And I was wrong. Okay. Good thing to be wrong on. The reason that it's not a problem when you test the vaccine. Normally you'd go for two years, right? Before, at least before you, you give it a license. Mm -hmm. The reason you do that is only because you wanna know how long the immunity lasts. All the side effects that you're likely to see happen within just a few months after giving the vaccine to people. And a lot of people I've talked to are worried about, you know, long-term side effects. Well, we really don't see anything after a few months. And that's why I think it's okay to have these novel vaccines licensed, uh, given an emergency use in less than a year, because I don't think there's going to be any long-term effects. We don't see that with other vaccines, and there's nothing in the makeup of these vaccines that would tell me that there would be. Now, I understand that people are worried. I get it totally, and you know, part of the problem is that you don't you don't know where to turn for for information. The whole vaccine issue is mired up in politics and 
and people wanting their rights. You know, I understand, but, you know, public health, you sometimes have to make amends. You have to give up some freedoms to protect everybody. And, you know, I, I the day I could, I got vaccinated. My wife and kids, we all got vaccinated because I, I have faith in them. And all I can tell people is, look, you can either talk to me like we're talking now and I can tell you what I think and why I totally respect your fears. And here's why I don't, I don't think you should worry about it. But you know what? In the end, you should just be brave. If you're scared, be brave and help humanity and try it because I don't think there's going to be any issue. I totally understand that you're worried, but history tells us that nothing long term is going to happen with these vaccines. So, you know, and these mRNA vaccines, by the way, had been worked on for five years before this. That's the only reason we could make them so quickly. So it's not like we just started on day one with something new and said, let's figure that out. No, this was worked out and ready, is it tested in animals of various sorts with different viruses. So we were ready to go on this. And you have to, you have to appreciate how much of a miracle it was to test them and now to make so much, millions and millions of doses. It just blows my mind. It's incredible. Yeah, it is kind of fascinating. And I'm glad you kind of touched on the fears of people because that me personally that I was I, I'm always thinking for some reason I go to like, okay, what's the worst that could happen? I don't know if it's just because like the environment that I'm always in as far as like talking to people and just hearing all kinds of points of views and, and the comments obviously are crazy on videos. And I'm sure you know that too. Um, but that's, that was I was scared. I was like, man, like, if I get this vaccine, like, Am I going to have an arm popping out of my head? Am I, you know, what are the long-term effects? There's no evidence, but to your point, there's, there's nothing in other vaccines that show you that there are long-term effects. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. and, and we've had tons of vaccines that have eradicated major diseases that have plagued people for years. So like, you know, so I, that makes me feel better. I don't know about anybody else listening or watching, but hearing someone that knows, like I said earlier, leaning on the side of silent science, hearing someone that knows what they're talking about makes me feel much better because that, that's one of my fears. I was like, man, what's going to happen to me in 10 years? They sure, don't know. Sure. You know? So the, the problem is that nobody could say there's going to be zero long term effects. Right. Nobody can say that. I would be the first to admit it. Right. But because we've never seen it with any other vaccine and this has been extensively tested. I don't, and I don't see what could go wrong. I would say it's really unlikely to happen and you should take your chances and be brave, you know, but the problem is I, I don't mind talking to people, but so many people get angry yeah. when you talk about this. And if I start saying, this is why the vaccines are probably okay. Then they say, Oh, you're, you're a big pharma shill. You get paid. I don't get paid by anybody. No, I don't. No. I'm I'm just talking as a scientist. But I just think some people have anger in them and they have a political agenda and so forth. But yeah, on YouTube, man, the comments can be really <laughs> tough. And then you can't talk to people. You can't. Oh, you don't know. But which drives me crazy. I said, look, I've been doing this for 40 years. I don't know everything. But this is what I do know. And you should listen to people who know. You know, I was on Lex Friedman a, a couple of months ago. And oh, he, wow. said, he said, he said, don't say you know something because people don't like that. People don't like when someone says, I know, I know, because I've been doing this a long time. And I totally get that people standing in positions of authority and, I, and saying, I know, and you don't. So I don't do that. I say, here's what I know. Tell me if you know something different. What are your fears? Let's try to address them. If I could, I would talk to everybody one-on-one, -on -one, but I can't. So, but most people don't want to, I find. That's the other part of the problem. Most people don't want to talk about it. That's so funny you say that. I've um <clears throat> I've recently put a lot of my content on TikTok and I've blown up. I've gone viral. I've had, you know, I just hit my first video with over a million views. I have like 10, 15 million views right now. And I just started my account like 30 days ago. And I'm taking little clips. Wow. Good for posted. you. Yeah, it's been great. Um, Someone said I should do TikTok. You should. Clips. Yeah. You should. Yeah. It's <laughs> I mean, it's a work. I mean, I'm a film, I'm a filmmaker in my past life. So like I know editing, so I can do it kind of quickly. Uh, but I'll take this hour plus video and I'll mm -hmm. micro macro it down to 20 clips that are two minutes to 15 minutes and put it on my second YouTube channel. And then I'll take those clips and take those down and I'll make like 30 different clips and I'll put it on TikTok every day. And man, the, <laughs> the conversations that I have and I don't have with people is fascinating. I had an economist talking about actual facts 
because he's an economist for the last mm-hmm. 35 years. Everybody in the comments knows this guy's a joke. I'm like, this guy's literally been doing this for yeah, I know. <laughs> longer than we've been alive. And yeah. it's like, you know, it's so it's the same thing. And then when you want to have yeah. these conversations with people, they they shrill up and they don't want to they don't want to talk because you're right. Yeah. It's it's so emotional. Imagine shaving with a sleek, well-designed, optimized trimmer that makes shaving time your favorite time. I'm one of the first people to use the Lawnmower 4.0 for Manscaped. And let me tell you, the craftsmanship on this goddamn thing is insane. It will chip away at all that down there. Trust me. I'm talking from personal experience. I use the, the lawnmower, get a little, uh, little little trimmy, trim, trim. And then I follow up with the ball deodorant. Let me tell you, if you like to go on hikes, if you like to just go outside and it's sweaty or it's hot out, Swamp Ass is non-existent. I could not go anywhere without the ball deodorant. I travel everywhere with it. It is a lifesaver, trust me. Manscaped engineered the ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent functionality and a grooming experience you'll never forget. The fourth generation trimmer also features a ceramic blade to reduce the risk of accidents. And thanks to their advanced skin safe technology, I feel way more comfortable shaving my boys. The upgraded trimmer also includes an on and off switch that can engage a travel lock. It also gives you the ability to turn on and off the 4000K LED light so you can get a more precise shave. The lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to cut through that hedge with more guard lengths with sizes one through four. Oh yeah, hey, did I mention um, wireless charging? That's fucking crazy. The new wireless charging system uses electromagnetic induction, which allows the battery to last way longer than it used to. Man, listen up. If you've been using the same nut trimmer on your face, you've been doing it all wrong. I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up with pubes in my mouth. It's time to get your own ball hair and body trimmer with Manscaped and make me time the best time. And trust me, you'll enhance your confidence if you got some nice smooth boys down there. Get 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code EXPLICIT20 at manscaped.com. Trust me, your balls will thank you. That it is. It's yeah. so politicized now that you can't have a conversation, a civil conversation with another human being about certain things, whether you feel completely different about a topic than they do. And it's, it's messed up, man. The internet's a wild place. But I, that's why I like talking long form like this with people like you, because I know a lot of people that follow me have a lot of the same fears that I have and I had. Mm. Um, and I think it's important for them to know this kind of stuff from a person, like you said, who has been doing it for so long. Not that you know everything, but you damn sure know more than I know. Uh, and that's why I'm talking to you. So, you know, do you have any idea kind of, and I know I talked to uh, like where the virus came from is where I'm going to get to. But when I talked to Rebecca Katz, she told me, she's like, for what we know now, it came from the wet markets, whether it was a bat or whatever, but that's where it came from. And that that was February 2020. A lot has changed. I know during the Trump administration, everyone was like, they mentioned it was in a Wuhan lab, and then that was a conspiracy theory, and then Biden took over, and then he launches a full investigation into that theory. Do we have any idea of kind of like more of a concrete idea of where it actually came from? Oh, I think we, we have some good evidence. Uh, we can't pinpoint it yet, but let's yeah, let's talk about that because every virus that we have in us at some point in the past came from some other animal. All right. We don't we don't have any brand new human viruses that didn't come from anywhere else. So and that includes polio and measles and every other virus you can think of. They came from some animal and we can sort of get an idea of uh, so measles we think cows have a related virus to measles. It's called rinderpest virus, right? And we started domesticating cows in the Middle East about 15,000 years ago. So they used to be wild animals and we found they had milk and we could drink it and we could eat them too. So we started figuring out how to breed them in corrals and then we got their viruses. And that's what we've done throughout history. We get close to animals, and we get their viruses. So every virus came from some other animal. We know in 2003, a coronavirus spilled over from uh, bats in a open air meat market in the south of China. Okay, this was a virus, a coronavirus. Now coronaviruses before that were not known to cause 
big epidemics in people. They were just known to cause common colds in humans anyway. And so this virus was, was pinpointed, it took about eight years to do this. Uh, a, a cave outside of the city had a collection of, vir- of bats that together would make up uh, this particular coronavirus, SARS-1. And the idea is that uh, those bats infected another intermediate animal, which was the civet cat. And the, the civet cats were uh, brought in from the, uh, the countryside into the wild, the, the live meat markets, and then those are what infected people. And we know this because those animals were collected. We found the virus in them. They, the meat handlers all had been infected and so forth. And so that was very clear. And it told us that in bats in at least China, there, there are coronaviruses that can infect people. So then you fast forward to 2019, you get this outbreak of uh, pneumonia in Wuhan. Now, in the meantime, China has instituted a pneumonia surveillance program because of SARS-1. If they get clusters of people with severe lung disease, then they they kick into play a whole host of things, including figuring out where it's coming from. So there were 40 cases of pneumonia in Wuhan in December 2019. They didn't have any other virus. They, they did some analysis and they found it was a novel coronavirus. And since then, people have been sampling bats in China, but also in other countries, in Japan, uh, Malaysia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand. And they're finding viruses very close to SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. They're not the exact virus. They're still too distant to be the, the, you know, the ancestral progenitor, if you will, of SARS-CoV-2. But it's very clear that bats in a very broad range of, of uh, Asia, not just China. In fact, a recent study out of Laos, actually, someone just told me you're supposed to call it Lao. The S is silent. Okay, oh. Lao. I did remember. Good. Wow. I never knew that. <laughs> I didn't either until on a live stream the other day. Uh, Someone said, it's, it, uh, Professor, it's Lao. Okay, no, S is silent. So, oh, wow. Learn something new every day. They went into a bat, a, a cave in Lao, and they collected some bats and they isolated a virus that is very similar to SARS CoV 2. Wow. So, we don't even know where the spillover came from, if it was in Wuhan, if it was somewhere else. So, it's kind of not fair to blame China at this point, because we we really don't know. I mean, I think the best explanation is a live animal market, because you you bring in live animals and they're infected and you butcher them there. And there's a lot of opportunity to get infected. But I have to say, in Wuhan, for all of 2019, there were no bats in the wild meat markets. There were no bats and no pangolins. So Hmm. if it were an animal, it has to be something else other than those two. Um, and so the other thing is, though, farmers in the countryside go into bat caves and farm the bat guano for fertilizer. There's a lot of opportunity for them to be infected there. They go in periodically and shovel it out, right, and bring it to the fields. So they could be infected. They could go home and spread it in their little family. Their family could get into town and spread it further. And then they could go into Wuhan and spread. You see, there's ample opportunity for it to spread, not just in a meat market, but it could be that kind of stuff, which will never probably track down. It'd be really hard to, to do that. Right, but right. So the bottom line here is that there's a lot of evidence, these very closely related viruses in bats, in nature, that that's where it came from. And now, as you said, a lot of people think it came from the virology lab in Wuhan, but I have to say there is zero evidence in support of that. It's just an idea because they work on coronaviruses. Maybe they had bat samples in the lab that had it. Well, they only have so many bat samples, right? And so if they don't have the right ones, it wouldn't have, whereas in the country, there's lots of encounters of people with bats and bat guano and so forth. So, you know, you have to, and those, the, the lady who runs that lab, uh, Zhang Li Shi, I know her. She's a good virologist trained in the West. And we've had conversations and and she said, I can't understand why they're blaming me. I have never had any related samples in my lab. In fact, nobody had SARS-CoV-2 before December 2019. She said, we don't have these samples, so there's no way that it could happen. And you know what? 
I believe her because she's a virologist trained like me. Now, a lot of people are, are would say to me, oh, Rack and Yellow, she, she's from communist China. How can you believe anything? She says, well, right. she's not a party member and she is a scientist. And until you prove otherwise, there's, you know, there's no data saying that it was in her lab. That's the bottom line. So I think in the end, if we find the origin, uh, this will turn out to be uh, f from wildlife spillover somewhere. And, and that's the end of that story. Right. Yeah, that makes that, honestly, that makes the most plausible sense anyways. Um, and that's kind of when I talked to Rebecca about it, that's exactly what she said. The, 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 the likelihood of it coming from anywhere, it would have been from if it was from a bat, it was from the wild or some sort of contagion or sure. one of these wet markets. And two things on this, though, is uh, if you're with Brett Weinstein. Yeah. So he was on Rogan. He's, and not, he a, was, he's not a virologist, by the way. He is not. He's not. <laughs> that for sure. He's not a virologist. Um, but he, he, he made a statement that, and, and I, I do think a lot of these people who, who A, are not virologists, tend to say things to kind of, not so much fear monger, but it gets more views. Uh, to be honest with you, the craziest things that I've had on my podcast say that I'm like, damn, like they need to go watch the rest of this clip because they're not going to get everything out of it. Always tend to do the best, which I, I kind of do it to myself sometimes, but when, when people like him say stuff like what I'm about to say, I kind of tilt my head a little bit because he basically said that he said two things about bats. One, because he actually studies bats, though. That, that is like his, his thing. Um, uh, he's not a virologist, but he, he understands bats and stuff like that. He said there was this one case of um, these filmmakers were filming like a scene of uh, outside of a cave, like what you were talking about in China. And it was like when all the bats come out, either in the morning or late at night to go feed, and they, they basically, the, the entire crew basically had uh, the guano all over them, which is, if anyone's listening, it's bat poop, um, all over them. It went in their eyes, their mouths, every single one of them, uh, except for one person died within like the next week because they got deathly ill. Um, and they basically said it was because of the bats. So he was basically saying at one side, yes, bats can, you know, give you these viruses and make you terribly sick and blah, 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 blah. And on the other hand, he said, when it comes to COVID, the fact that, and, and, and like I said, he's not a virologist, but he was making statements like a virologist would, and I, that's why I want to ask you this. He's basically said that um, the virus had to come from a lab because um, a virus can't this quickly learn how to jump from host to host. And then also he said the other thing was it can't um, be as infectious as it is from the jump, it has to learn how to do those things over extended period of time, unless if it had those attributes injected into it. So my question, I've always wanted to know this, I haven't been able to speak to anyone until you, is, is that even true? Um, can a virus, a novel virus, brand new, start fresh and be able to jump from host to host as quickly as COVID did, be as infectious as it is? Uh, is that possible? All right. So Brett is completely wrong in that statement. Okay. Okay. hundred percent wrong. Viruses can't learn quickly enough. It's just a total misinformational statement. So RNA viruses in particular mutate a lot. Every time they reproduce in a cell, they make tons of mutants. So one bat in a cave, and it could be a million bats in that cave, that one bat has incredible diversity of viruses every day, every time it produces new viruses. And the whole cave full of bats can make a virus that would infect a human somewhere on earth really well by chance, because that's the way mutation works. But there are no humans in the cave most of the time. So that virus ends up fizzling out in the bat and you never see it. And that's what this is all about. Chance encounters between humans and some other animals. So what we what we know is that in a bat, and in fact, the virus is isolated in Lao, you know, there's a part of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 that attaches to the receptor, right? It's called the receptor binding domain. Those bat viruses from Lao are almost identical to SARS-CoV-2 in the receptor binding domain. Hmm. That those viruses never came near a lab. They're just randomly changing in bats. And by chance, 
you get one that can infect humans. And then it's a matter of encounter. And then the question is, so you, you can make something pretty close to what's needed to spread quickly in humans, just in a cave somewhere. It doesn't take a lot of spread in humans. But then let's say you need a little more change. Now for SARS-1, we know what was in the bat cave and what ended up in people. There are not a lot of changes between those two. It didn't seem to take very much for it to go into humans really well, even though SARS-1 was a wimpy virus. It didn't transmit very well. Right. You, don't need, you don't need a lot of change or you might need quite a bit, but we are completely comfortable, virologists, meaning we, saying maybe this virus uh, entered people in January of 2019. It was just kind of percolating around in the countryside among the farmers who farm, you know, bat poo. And then maybe at some point after a year of evolution in people, then it got the right sequence. I don't think it took that long. I think it probably went into people at, at some place, maybe October, November 2019, uh, jumped a few times uh, and rapidly was selected. And as Brett says, that's impossible to happen so quickly. He's wrong you can get selection of viruses to do all kinds of things very quickly. And so whether it took a year or a month, it can happen because the virus could be very close to what you need already just randomly. I mean, that's the key. You have to understand there are huge populations of viruses in these bats and every possible sequence could be there that's needed to infect people. And it's just a matter of encountering. And of course, then when it gets into a person, Maybe that person has a really good immune system and they clear it and that's the end of the infection. Mm. So maybe you have to wait for a kind of older farmer to get infected and then maybe the virus gets going. Then he brings it home to his elderly wife, you know, and then it's so sure this can all happen. Absolutely. And this is what virologists think about all the time. And I'm sure Weinstein does not. And that's why he thinks it's impossible. But, you know, Corey, in science, you should never say impossible because you're going to end up being proven wrong at some point. <laughs> right. Right. Now that, that, that makes total sense. And that's kind of why, like I said, I tilted my head a little bit because he was so sure. I believed him on the bat thing. Cause that's, that's his thing. But on that side of that side of the, the, the fact that, that it couldn't do certain, certain things without help of, of human. Uh, and, and that makes sense of what you just said, because, you know, if, if the perfect storm happens at this one bat in a cave, it can get close enough to where it could be ready to jump and jump and jump and mutate and mutate and mutate. And then, then you have what sure. we have, you know, but, but Corey, even his story about the, was it a film crew and they got yeah. bat? Well, I don't buy that at all, but you know, in, in Austin, Texas, there's a, there's a bridge and every night the bat half a million bats fly out and people go to see it. Yeah. I went to see it. They just flow out. And people don't get sick from that. I wow. just, I'm not, I'm not buying that bat story. <laughs> no, hey, listen. Well, he he could have, like I said, he could have been kind of like pushing on those buttons. He was on Rogan. It was kind of a, it was, it was the biggest clip in the whole podcast. It was like the one that, like, because he was basically saying, Wuhan Lab started this because of what we just talked about, the possibilities of of the COVID virus not being able to mutate. And no, be no. so infectious, which so that's a fundamental key thing. Viruses can can change very quickly. Like they change quickly all the time. But then whether you have the right selection or not depends. But there's nothing to say that it couldn't happen very quickly, or or it might take a year. And I think that's doing a disservice for Rogan to have him on to talk about a virus because he really doesn't get viruses. And you know, it's not an insult to him because he's an evolutionary biologist, okay? And I don't know much about the evolution of bats. And I'd be the first to say, no, you don't want me on your show to talk about that. Right. But he needed to get a virologist on to talk about it because Brett simply doesn't think about it all the time. Right, yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, as far as the mutations, is that what we kind of saw from the, was it the Delta variant? Is What are the differences between, Was because, uh, hold on, let me just take it back for a second. Um, I not going to would have not been infected with COVID at all. Thank God. Um, of, I know a lot of people that have, and um, a friend of mine, my colleague, he got it, but the doctor said, Oh, you got COVID too. Like he got like a second version of it. And this is before the Delta came out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So I was like, eh, how much does this, how much do they know? And it kind of kicked his ass a little bit, but correct me if I'm wrong. The first round of COVID was like, the worst and then it kind of you know they told us delta was more infectious but it's not as deadly 
Um, how does that work out? I would think if something's mutating, it would mutate to something worse, just like in the movies. All right. So that's another thing we should talk about because what, what viruses re are reproducing in a host, they're, they're mutating, right? Mm -hmm. I already told you that, whether it's bats or humans or cows, right. they're always mutating. And then whether the mutations make a difference or not, that's the point. And so we call that selection. So if there's selection for some property, then the mutant that's better at that will get selected. So if, for example, the virus doesn't transmit well from person to person, you could imagine a mutant arising randomly, which transmitted better. And so now that's going to transmit well, and that'll predominate, right? So that's a property that could be selected. On the other hand, there's really no selection for, for killing a host faster. Viruses need their hosts to reproduce in, right? So it doesn't make any sense to me that a virus would become more lethal, that there would be any selection for a virus to be more lethal, unless that accidentally went along with some other property that was important. So what has been happening since day one, SARS-CoV-2 starts spreading globally. First uh, months, it's changing, but we're not picking up any signatures that seem to, to stick around. But then in November 2019, then we see first in the UK, the alpha variant, which they, we call it now. Mm -hmm. And it has some changes in the spike and, and viruses with those changes propagate throughout the UK and then they spread elsewhere. And then subsequently beta variants in South Africa, uh, in, in South America. And then of course, the most recent one, the Delta arose, was first detected in India and then seems to have predominated globally. And these all have changes that are presumably being selected for, you know, the viruses are just randomly mutating in people. And the more people globally that are infected, the more mutations you're going to have, right? right. Um, and then at some point, some mutation in spike gives the virus some advantage. And so that mutate, a virus with that mutation will predominate. So that's what's happened as we have this successive wave of alpha and beta and gamma and delta and so forth. Mm. Now, the problem is that we're still in a pandemic and there's still lots of unvaccinated, uninfected people to be infected. And so when beta, when alpha is spreading through the UK, they, the, the health people say, oh, it's more contagious. But that's wrong because you have unvaccinated people. They're going to be infected with whatever SARS-CoV-2 right. is around. And the reason that alpha predominated was that it was more fit than its predecessor. It could do something better. And what that is, we don't know. And event, that goes all the way down to Delta. Delta is really good at uh, moving through a population. But, you know, there are some people who said, oh, you could walk by someone for 15 seconds and get Delta. And that's just wrong. That's just not what Delta is about. Delta is about other properties that give the virus, you know, this concept of fitness, right? Darwin said survival of the fittest, right? So if a bird is on an island and there, there's some really thick seeds, a bird that's randomly born with a thick beak will be able to eat those seeds. And then that bird's offspring will predominate the survival of the birds with the big beaks, that's survival of the fittest. And it happens for viruses as well. So that is what has been going on with these variants. They're not, reports of them being more lethal are completely wrong. Hmm. CDC this week just came out with a report saying no evidence that Delta is more lethal. And, you know, all along they were saying it was because the data are flawed. It's really hard in an outbreak to make those kinds of inclusions, you really have to step back and do careful studies that take a long time, which you don't have uh, right. in an outbreak. So right. my view of these variants are they're more fit than the previous one. Um, they do evade antibodies to a certain extent, but we have no idea what that means because we don't even know how much antibody you need to protect you. Right. So right. if a variant makes your antibody titer go from 100 to 50, what does it mean? We have no idea. You're probably still protected. And, the, and you know, I want to just say in the end that all the vaccines in the U.S. anyway still protect you against lethal disease and death in the high 90 percent with all these variants. So it doesn't matter in the end. So I am not as concerned. Unfortunately, the variant 
narrative has gotten so much publicity that everyone thinks it's a done deal. It's a fact that one variant is more transmissible and more variant than another, virulent. And it's just not true. It's not supported by most uh, of the data. So I always tell people, just get vaccinated, wear a mask, forget about variant. It's SARS-CoV-2. There are, there are things you can still do to protect yourself. Right. So they're basically, in a nutshell, not, not that they're identical, or they're the same, but they're somewhat the same, and they're going to have the same kind of, uh, you know, things happen to you, whether, whether you get the Delta, the Alpha, the whatever, COVID, whatever. It's going to happen. The same thing is going to happen to you, right? So just get yeah, vaccinated. I think there's no difference in disease, and the vaccines will still work. So. Right. People like to get very upset about new variants. You know, now there's a Delta Plus. And yeah, I said, I just, just if you're vaccinated, don't worry. Go to work. Do your thing. Don't, it's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, quick question on the, um, I, I, was, I was talking to somebody and they, they kind of mentioned this. They said that the early on, so the, the, the virus being lethal, uh, People are going to hear me think, oh, well, I don't care about human life. We've lost over 700,000 people in the U.S. from, from COVID. Um, that's a terrible thing. And do you think that um, the people that were early on, the reason why uh, we thought it was so lethal, not that I'm saying it's not, um, did we think it was way more like 100 times more lethal than it was because of the people? The people that we were testing were sick enough to go to the hospital versus if I had it, um, I would, I could have maybe not gone to the hospital or I would have been in and out or whatever. Is, is that why we kind of thought on top of not having all the data and information? Yeah, of course. So, so lethality, the, the easiest way to calculate it is to say of all the people that we've tested and who are positive, how many of them have died? Right? So yeah, in the beginning, we only tested the really the sick people. Right. And so that gave a bias to the lethality and, what you really want to know is how many people die out of everybody infected, but you don't know because you're not testing everyone and you can never know that. So you, you can do approximations of that number and they're all less than 1% as opposed to say, depending on your age, if you're over 80, the lethality is 10 to 15% deaths over confirmed cases. So the, we, all we know is the number of people who have died of COVID in the U S 700,000, as you say, I don't know how many people have been infected, so it's hard to know that. And so I, I think you're you're partially right. We we were biased by the testing, especially early on. Also early on, we were protecting kids. We kept them home from schools and so forth. And now we're letting them back in school and we're having more and more kids infected. And even though the, the fatality rate is lower among kids, they do die. They can die. They can get serious disease, which we weren't seeing at the beginning of the outbreak. Right. I like to show us a slide uh, from the earliest data in China, which shows in January in Wuhan, in the eldest population, the fatality rate was 10, 15%. And then as when you get to April, it's down to 2%. And, you know, we, we realized that it was targeting older people, the serious disease at least was more likely in older people. So they were being more careful, but also in the beginning, hospitals were overburdened. They couldn't take care of people. That gives you more people dying. They learned how to take care of people. So fatality is a squishy number, I like to say. It's not a, it's not a constant. It really depends on age. It depends on when you are in the outbreak. It depends on your hospital system. And so you can't make blanket uh, descriptions. Um, if you want to say the real number, it's a, it's a, it's a statistical calculation and you just don't know that it's that it's right. But I, what we do know now is that if you're older, you're at higher risk for serious disease compared to being younger, for sure. Right. Yeah. And that, and of course, I see stuff like this in the news all the time, where it's like I always read about, oh, 26 year old healthy man dies of COVID, and I'm like, I, and then I, of course I read, and I'm like, well, he had like lymphoma or lymphoma or something like crazy sure. uh, that they don't talk about. Just like they kind of, uh, the media really pissed me off the other day when they, when Colin Powell died uh, and they said, Colin Powell dies. And it's like uh, with COVID complicate. And I'm just like, you have to throw that in there to kind of scaremonger people. And course, a friend, of, friend, friend of mine, uh, Anthony Davies said, he's like, you know, cause I always talk to him about economics and these crazy big things that are happening. And he's like, listen, he's like, 
if it's in the news, typically it's very rare. It's it's only in the news because it's happening so little that they need to blow it up, like the whole nursing, uh, nurses quitting and all that stuff. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's that's kind of what I was piggybacking off of the uh, – the, the early on stuff that we didn't know of like, is it really lethal? Of course it's lethal. It's killing people. It's just yeah. not killing, yeah. you know, 20 plus year olds. It's killing 80 plus year olds more frequently because they're more uh, susceptible. Um, can you explain to me what asymptomatic is? Because I hear this stuff and this is another thing that gets tied up in the media of what that actually means. Oh, well, I'm, I might be asymptomatic. I might have it, but I can't spread it. That's I hear that too. And can you kind of clear up like what the hell asymptomatic means? So, so asymptomatic, as we, with reference to a virus infection, simply means you don't have any symptoms. So what is a symptom? It's an important word because it's different from a sign. You can talk about symptoms of infection or signs. A sign is what someone else can see. So if you have a rash from measles, that's a sign because somebody, the doctor can look at it and say, oh, you might have measles, right? But if you have an upset stomach, that's a symptom. Only you can feel it. Hmm. Upset stomach, muscle aches, you know, sore throat. Those are symptoms because only the patient can say, I have this or that. Right. And whereas a sign, other people can observe. Now, if someone took your blood and measured virus in it and found virus, you wouldn't know that. So that's not a symptom, but it's a sign because it can be measured by someone else, right? Yeah, right. So asymptomatic means you don't feel anything different. You don't feel upset stomach. You don't feel tired. You don't have a sore throat. But I guarantee if we look in your nose, we could find virus, virus RNA by PCR. That's a sign. So asymptomatic is very specific. It means you cannot feel anything different. And the problem with that is some people think, well, how can I be infected and be asymptomatic? Well, that's because Symptoms are only part of the whole picture. The signs, which are your immune response kicking in, the virus load in your nose, we could measure that and that would be there for sure. But um, symptomatic is simply an infection that goes through its course and you don't feel anything. And remember, the other problem with symptoms is your threshold for symptoms might be different from mine. So what knocks you out could do nothing to me, right? right? right. I could say, oh, I felt fine the last two weeks and the same things would have made you, uh, you know, tired and whatever. So whenever you ask a person in a, in a study, you know, have you had any symptoms of the following? They'd say, no, 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 no. But then the next person who might say yes, yes. And they both had the same, but they perceive it differently. So symptomatology is a very subjective issue, but it simply refers to you feeling some effect of an infection. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 can cause about 20% of infections are asymptomatic. And that is the virus gets in you, it reproduces in your upper tract, mostly it doesn't spread down into your lung. The, your immune response responds. So you could, it, you could measure antibodies, you would probably be protected against infection. But most importantly, you can transmit the virus to someone else, despite you not feeling anything from the infection. Right. We know for sure that asymptomatic infections uh, can certainly transmit. And that was learned very early out. And that's different from SARS-1, where when you were at the transmission phase, you were pretty sick most of the time. And you were often in the hospital, which is why we could limit transmission and eventually stop that outbreak. But you here, knew. you knew it. Here, so many people are infected and walking around that's why it spread so well. Right. And, and that's another reason why, like you said earlier about wearing masks, like even if you don't feel sick, you could still be sick and getting vaccinated yes. and, and wearing a mask can at least help mitigate that. Um, not that it won't prevent it, but it'll help with that. And if we had a test that you could do every day for five cents a day, so you would do it every day, no problem. Mm -hmm. You would know when you're infected, even if you're asymptomatic and then you'd stay home. And that's the way, you know, you asked me before, how could we have stopped this early on? That would have been the way to do it. And right. so now right. in, in many countries in Europe, they give out free tests that you can go every day and get a free test and see if you're infected. That would be great for school, right? A kid wakes up in the morning, they swab their nose five minutes later, 
oh, I'm negative. I'm going to school. And it didn't cost anything or it cost you five cents. That's what we need. And right. that would really make a big difference. Yeah, that goes back to your idea of the early beginning of having just mass mm -hmm. tests and all that stuff and really kind of trying to figure that stuff out. Yeah, that, that would that would be great. Because I, I, it's funny, I feel uh, anytime I feel sick now, like I'll, I'll wake up and it'll be early, this morning, I took my fiance to the airport. She's heading over your way to New York. And um, I was I felt sniffle on the way back. And I'm like, Oh, shit, here we go. I got to go. to the, <laughs> I got to go to the, the, the emergency room. I got to get a test real quick. And if, now I feel fine. I sound fine. I have no, no congestion. It was just because I woke up early. But I think it, in my head, I'm like, Oh, it's COVID, whatever. And like I said earlier, and Marco, what I haven't been, I haven't had it, but not that I know of. I mean, I've been tested plenty of times. I don't know if I have it or not, but um. Well, you've had PCR tests or, or antigen tests probably, but you could go and get an antibody test and see if you've ever, well, you've yep. been vaccinated. So yep. you could have an antibody test that would distinguish between vaccination and infection. Hmm. You can do know. that. I wanted to have my uh, fiance tested for the antibodies. Cause like I said, I'm pretty mm. sure she had it. Um, but at the time they weren't, they were only testing for flu. Um, so about the flu. Can we kind of talk a little bit about the difference between influenza and COVID um, and, you know, the difference of coronavirus and, uh, and, and influenza? Because when I talk to and, and one of my last questions for you will be be similar to this is um, I asked Rebecca Katz, I'm like, what's your biggest fear? And she was like, influenza. She's like, if we have another Spanish flu type situation where we can't get a hold of it. And, you know, th that was like her biggest fear. Um, and at that time, we really couldn't, we talked a little bit about the difference of influenza and, co and a coronavirus, not the coronavirus that we had, because she didn't know anything about it. Um, can you kind of tell the difference of influenza and, and you know, coronavirus? So first, there, there are two different kinds of viruses, right? Mm -hmm. there, we classify viruses in, in ways that we don't need to talk about, but flu and corona are really different viruses, although they both infect the respiratory tract. They have a different chemical makeup and, and they have a different biology, um, but they both will infect the upper tract. Typically you inhale them and, and then you have this upper tract here lined with cells that is a really good place for viruses to reproduce. Then the virus moves down into the back of your throat, you get sore throat, you get coughing. And so it flu, and coronavirus so far look pretty similar. In fact, the, even the time course is, is similar in terms of infected, then within a few days, you, you may show symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, most cases, and influenza tends to move down into the trachea, right? Which is the, the first part of your uh, windpipe is the trachea. And then you go down into the bronchi and then it splits into the lobes of the two lungs. Influenza typically goes down into the trachea and reproduces in the cells that line that tube. And you typically feel like a pain, substernal pain, it's called, with influenza. But most cases don't go down into the lower parts of the lung. They don't cause pneumonia, although they can, especially in elderly people. Flu, flu virus can go all the way down into the alveoli, with the, which are the air sacs of the lung, and wreak havoc there, and you get viral pneumonia. But what flu doesn't do, the coronavirus does the same thing, enters the upper tract, you get a common cold type syndrome, it can go down into the lungs and cause havoc in the lungs. But most people re re resolve the infection unless you're older or have comorbidities with right. uh, coronaviruses. But what coronaviruses do that influenza, most influenza viruses do not is that they cause this incredible inflammatory disease. And that's where the severe COVID comes in. You know, Most people have a, a two week viral illness they recover, but then other people go on, their virus is clearing, but then they have trouble breathing. They go into the ICU, they get put on oxygen and they can die. And all of that serious COVID is because of your immune response. Hmm. And we don't often see that with influenza virus. Influenza virus is largely a virus driven disease. There's some role of immune responses in the trachea, but we don't see that systemic, which means involves your whole body with coronavirus, right? Not only you can't breathe, but you have intestinal problems, you have neurological issues, you can have a skin rash and so forth. The virus, it's not actually the virus that's doing any of that. It's your immune response. So we call that an inflammatory disease or cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. 
we are overreacting to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and that causes the most serious disease. It's not actually the virus, and it's not everyone. It's older people and people with comorbidities. We don't quite understand why that happens in a certain fraction of people. I would say that's the biggest difference between uh, influenza virus and SARS-CoV-2. They're both respiratory viruses transmitted in a similar way by respiratory droplets, but then that late disease in COVID and also long COVID is unique. Right. Wow. That's crazy. So it just basically goes deeper. It affects, and also depends on how you respond, your body. That's it, responds. how you respond. So for COVID, if you have a normal immune response, you clear the infection in two weeks and you're okay. Mm -hmm. But in the long, in the uh, more serious COVID, your immune response goes overboard. Right. Right. So immune responses can be dangerous because they're meant to eliminate a virus and that could cause damage to you. And so they have to be regulated. So for some reason, in certain people, the immune response isn't regulated and you're making all these proteins that can go throughout your body. Mm -hmm. And so you get effects in every organ system. Right. right and that's right. that is COVID. That's severe COVID. And that and the death is largely because you can't breathe. You can't get enough oxygen. They could put, you know, 10, 12 liters of oxygen a minute into your lung, pure oxygen, and you still can't breathe because there's so much uh, damage in your lungs from the inflammation, not from the virus, from your immune response. Right. So your own body is almost doing this to you. Your body is doing it. And so that's why when you're in this late phase, steroids can mm. be helpful because they're immunosuppressive and they will dampen that overreactive immune response. Right. Well, it, that's uh, two questions now that came of what you just said is um, the, 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 um, oh my God, what was it when I saw, so, so basically the healthier you are, that's why you saw a lot of obese people with diabetes, uh, preexisting conditions, stuff like that had a harder time because their, their immune response might not have been top shelf. Like it would be if mm -hmm. they were in a healthier state, correct? That's right. No, the healthier people tend to do well, which is not to say all of them, some Apparently, mm -hmm. healthy people will die, but apparently is the key word, right? They have something with them that we don't know about. They must have a mutation somewhere in right. some critical immune gene that we haven't picked up, and that's what gets them, yes. Right, and so so with that, how come, and I know, I mean, you probably, you, you might have an opinion on this, but not like any data to back this up, because there really is none. The, why wasn't that talked about a lot? versus it was always like, listen, just get vaccinated, wear a mask versus go outside, make sure you have vitamin D, take some good, you know, B12, exercise, take better care of yourself. Because that, especially if we know that how your body responds is going to determine on how bad this virus affects you, wouldn't that make sense to, to push that agenda as well? I think uh, yes, I would agree. And so, for example, I take vitamin D because mm -hmm. especially in the winter, I don't get out. I don't get much sunlight, which sunlight is great to generate vitamin D. But if you can't, you take it. And vitamin D has a lot of different effects. And then one of them is it helps you make a robust immune response, right? right? So a long time ago, a doctor told me you should take vitamin D uh, just for that, and I, and I agree, and if, as long as you don't take too much, it's no problem. And yeah, ha have a healthy life, you know, exercise and so forth. Um, I, I think depending on who you listen to, that was part of the agenda. But the point is, it can't be the only approach because that alone is not gonna be enough because you can have great habits, exercise, eat well, get a lot of sleep, take vitamin D. But if you have a mutation in some gene that affects your immune response, that you don't know about, and, and many of us do, then it, that could be lethal when you get infected, despite everything else. Everything else you've done will be overridden by that. So that's why it's important to do everything you can, including that, but also vaccinating and masking, because right. the healthy lifestyle itself will not save you. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's kind of what I was getting at is like, I didn't see any of the, the big players that were really, you know, the at the time, like, for example, Fauci, like, was the voice of, of this mm -hmm. whole thing. And, you know, not once that I ever really hear him talk about that side, it was more like masks and vaccinations and stuff like that. Um, versus like, 
you know, he, he may or may not have brought it up, but it wasn't like a kind of staple. Uh, and I agree. I think if you need to do everything you can, not just one thing. Like, for example, Rogan, he just had COVID, Joe Rogan. Now, he, he made a video and he was like, oh, you know, I had, uh, was it the ivermectin, uh, hydrochloroquine? I had IVs, drips and all that. And I'm like, bro, first of all, you're a millionaire. You have the ability to have those things doctors come to your house and take care of you. Not everybody has that. So that's ridiculous for one, but you know, he's obviously extremely healthy. He's 50 plus years old. He's, he's in great shape. Um, but he was kind of trying to push like, listen, like I took all these drugs that are never talked about. And ever, that's when everybody was saying he was taking horse tranquilizers and stuff like that. Um, but th that's, he's, he, his, he's probably the only one that I, that I listen to that I hear in the mainstream that, would push a healthy lifestyle not and he's like listen the vaccine get a vaccine yes you know uh wear masks yes but also do this so that's why i was always kind of confused like why wouldn't fauci mm -hmm. kind of like push everything not just the vaccines or the masks you know and then of course he got caught up sure. in a couple things you know telling people to double mask and at one point he said if you get vaccinated you won't have to wear a mask anymore and then that changed so do you yeah, think uh, like the, the white lie almost like, Hey, I almost have to lie to people to protect them. Do you think that kind of played an look, effect? I think, I think it's all about messaging, right? right? So when you're dealing with hundreds of millions of people, you have to deliver a message that's going to reach as many of them as possible. And so they have, you know, it's NIH and CDC in the U S have to decide what message mm. they're going to give. And in a pandemic, it can change pretty quickly. So back in May, you know, when numbers were going down and they said, okay, vaccinated people can take off their masks. I thought that was a mistake because there's still enough unvaccinated people to spur an outbreak. And in fact, that's what happened. Then in the summer, the cases shot up and then they changed their mind, which I think was bad messaging. I think uh, they should have not changed it back in May. But more importantly, the healthy lifestyle messaging, I think, the, and I don't know what they're thinking. I'm just guessing. I think they're worried that people will get that and say, oh, this is all I have to do. I don't have to get vaccinated. I don't have to wear a mask. All I need to do is live well and take care of myself. So I think they they wanted to avoid that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that it, Fauci at one point was asked if he took vitamin D, and he said, yes, I do. So I, maybe that's one of the things that we have learned, that maybe early on you you do a whole package of, of things. Here's what you have to do besides sleeping well and eating well and all of that, you have to wear a mask and get vaccinated because that will give you the complete protection, right? Right. right. And I, I, so I think I agree that there have been messaging issues throughout this. It's not easy because most of the people around have never lived through a pandemic like 1918, right? So True. they have no lessons. Now we've learned a lot and hopefully that will remain, but maybe we're not going to have another s severe one for another hundred years. Who knows? Right. I mean, right, this right. is not as severe as 1918 for no, sure. Right. So I I'm just hoping we learn lessons from this and that they remain because there are a lot of lessons and uh, a lot of things that could have been done, but weren't. I'm hoping we're learning about that. Right. I think that's a great point and a great way to look at it as far as not to be, not that you can't be critical of these people that are in, in place of you know, the, the faces of these things. But I feel like people are too critical to your point of, you know, how many outbreaks have, have you been through zero until this time? You know what I mean? So it's like, as far as like at this scale, and, and I think it's kind of like, it's, it's not really fair to come for the head of somebody or whatever, because to your point, the viruses can change, you know, in 24 hours, the message could changing. And I agree with you, sure. the messaging yeah. wasn't, it wasn't consistent. I mean, throughout i mean I, I lived in dc during the the main part of the pandemic and it was like what can i do what can i do i don't know i'm just going to do something until someone tells me not to do it because i don't know so i think that's a really big learning curve that i think i hope that we learned in the future is like putting the right message out there but you're right 360 million people you, there's not one perfect thing you can say no. to make everybody happy no. no it's very hard and you know it's easy for us to criticize and i have to say you know we criticized a lot on our podcast uh, throughout the pandemic. We have pointed out where people uh, have been wrong, but, you know, you do it in a constructive way, right? You say, right. you know, this could have been done better. Maybe this should have been done. And then people tend to listen. But if you come out of the gates 
you know, with a sword, then nobody's going to listen to you. And I think, as we said earlier, a lot of people have this anger um, in all things, and uh, it's not constructive. Right. I totally agree. The, the one thing I hope that they don't do, which I know they probably will, is make it such a political, make it seem such like a political agenda. You have Mayor Bellasio on, you know, this is to my point of like a healthy lifestyle. He's like doing a press conference, eating a cheeseburger and a hamburger saying, you can get this if you go down to, you know, if you get your vaccine, you get a free burger. And I'm thinking like, man, like that's literally like counterproductive of what you should be telling people. But it was kind of like, these politicians were just really using it to kind of, yeah. you know, they all had an agenda um, and they all have people that they have to, you know, look out for and, and themselves, you know, mainly, but that was, I think the saddest part that I saw was like, you know, they're kind of putting people's lives in, you know, in, in harm's way just to kind of get ahead in certain ways, which I thought totally agree. to your point, you're, you're a virologist, like you said, with the, the woman from China, I agree. I would totally believe her if she said that to me, because why would she, she wants to help people. She wants to solve diseases. She wants to do all these great things. Why would she unleash this thing or what, you know what I mean? Like I just, when you really think about things, it, it doesn't really, it makes a lot of sense when you just kind of dumb it down a little bit like that. And I think the politicians just took it way too far and they put a lot of people in harm's way and a lot of information they didn't know I get, but at the same time, I feel like they've really stretched it and took advantage of the situation. Well, I think politicizing people's lives is is criminal, frankly, to say, oh, you don't need vaccines, you don't need a mask just mm -hmm. to push your political agenda because you know people are going to vote for you of, of a certain ilk, right? I think that's horrible. Yep. And you know, many states have done that. Many states have said you can't have mask mandates, you can't even have vaccine mandates. What nonsense is that to play with someone's lives? And why don't their supporters get that, right? right? I think human life is incredible. It's amazing that it works. It's precious. Every life is, but we're well conscious of each other. And why would you do something to put it in jeopardy just to, to further yourself? Doesn't I, I don't get it at all. Yeah. Right, same. I know, I know when I see Abbott and DeSantis like knocking down mandates in Florida and obviously it's, a, you know, that's the, those republican states that's kind of what they want to do and you know DeSantis might be looking for 2024 you know he might have that, that good backing and stuff like that but to your point like now you're playing with people's lives so yeah. you can it's wrong it's just it, wrong, it is wrong. Yeah. It, either way left right doesn't matter if, you, if you're doing that it, it's 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 messed up yeah. um well one more question and i'll let you get out of here i know you got a a, a gig at four o'clock um What's the most, what's your biggest worry? What's like the most terrifying or worrisome virus that you, what keeps you up at night when it comes to viruses? <laughs> Fear mongering. Let's go. Go on. Actually, the, uh, the virus that worries me the most is rabies because it's almost a hundred percent fatal unless you get vaccinated. But fortunately there's, we know how to protect it against it right we have a great vaccine although in many countries they don't use it because they don't have it and there's a lot of rabies spread by dogs there's a lot of wild animals that uh, have rabies but the 100 percent fatality if you are bitten by a rabid animal you're going to die unless you've been vaccinated and there's no other virus like that that i'm aware of the good thing is it doesn't transmit from person to person. So when people ask me, what virus are you afraid of? That would be it. The, the reality is that we are pretty good at taking care of any new virus uh, that spills over. And the only reason SARS-CoV-2 wreaked so much havoc is because so many countries made dumbass moves, including ours, and they didn't do the right things. And because in part it was politically motivated. We had a president who didn't believe it was a big deal. How can you be so screwed up to think that right, and put right. people's lives in danger instead of testing right away and saying, we have an issue here. Let's get testing out the door in two weeks uh, to, to ignore it. And many other countries did the same thing. Uh, because of that, the virus spread way more than it should be. Um, but even more than that, we we actually could have prevented this pandemic because after SARS-1, we knew there were bats in China and probably elsewhere that harbor uh, dangerous coronaviruses. And we could have started making antivirals that would have protected them. In fact, the 
the one antiviral that looks good, molnupiravir, which may be approved, you know, in a couple of months, that's an oral antiviral that was developed five years ago and never, never tested in people. It could have been tested through phase one, you know, 20 people for safety and been ready. And it would have been used at the beginning of the outbreak. It could have quelled it. That would have been possible, but nobody wanted to spend the money to do that. So that's actually what worries me. It's not viruses, it's human behavior that we're going to forget about that. And we're not going to be ready for the next one. Now, a lot of people are having pandemic planning and committees to say, what should we be doing for the next one? I just think once this is over, all that gets forgotten and we're not in the position that we need to be. We could easily stop any new virus if we would just invest the money that we need. But companies don't want to invest if there's no virus, right? Because they're, they're driven by profit. And in the US, the, the NIH, which supports most of the research, National Institutes of Health, they don't have enough money to, to, to do all of this. It's, it's really bad priorities. So I worry about not being ready for the next SARS-CoV-2. I'm not worried about any particular virus because I really think we could handle it if we would just get our act together and be prepared and have the right drugs and even vaccines to uh, take care of it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, And that kind of plays with what we talked about earlier about people just that kind of 24-hour forget about like syndrome that yeah, we have, you sure. know, we have a mass shooting and then, oh my God, you know, we see everything on Facebook. We like it. We love it. We share it. And 24 hours later, it's like, oh, yeah. it, ne it never happened. Um, that actually, that, that scares me more to your point than any, mm -hmm. any virus, but hey, amen. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate talking to you. I learned a lot. I know my, my viewers and my watchers, my listeners will, will appreciate it. And, um, you know, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to reach some more people with uh, some information about viruses. That's what I'm doing. Right. And so where can people find you? Do you have any books out? Do you have, I'll put everything obviously in the description, but. So I think for, for the most relevant would be my podcast this week in virology, which you can find anywhere. There are podcasts. I have a YouTube channel. My, my handle is prof V R R P R O F V R R in there. We have all my podcasts, uh, my virology course. I do a Wednesday night live stream where I answer COVID questions along with my colleague uh, at, at Columbia, Amy Rosenfeld. So you can go to that with your COVID questions. I'm also teaching virology live stream twice a week. You can find all of that on YouTube. So I, I give of myself as much as I can to teach the world about viruses. That's amazing. I really appreciate that. And I'll put all those links uh, in the description below. And then thank that way you. you guys can click on that. But once again, Vincent, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Great talking to you. Thank you, man. That's another uh, episode for E4 Explicit Podcast. And we'll see you next time. Get 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code explicit20 at manscaped.com. That's right. 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code explicit20 at manscaped.com. Unlock that confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped.